No innovation. We have innovation. <laughs> Excellent. Innovation. When you think of innovation, what a sexy word. Innovation to me means bold. It means technology. It means futuristic. It means all kinds of things that can be invented. You look at innovation, look at bold statements, look at what uh, President John F. Kennedy did in 1961. He boldly told the world, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely. Because of that statement, in 1969, we did it. But we did it with 1,600 innovative ideas. 1,600 inventions happened because of that. When you think of, like, if I asked a question, who are some of the biggest innovators that you've seen in your lifetime? I see these light bulbs going off in the audience. Now I say sustainability. Who are some of the most sustainable people in your lifetime? Who's a, who's a giant sustainer in your world? These light bulbs just all popped. Where'd the light go? A sustainer. It sounds like something you, when you spill coffee on your shirt in the morning. Sustain. Why is, why is innovation and sustainability so separated? I'm here saying that there's things that innovation has done that's been unbelievable. But we have to evaluate that and how does it relate to sustainability. And what you're going to see is you're going to see bold statements in innovation, but it takes the action of people in this room, the everyday common man like myself, to make these things happen. Let's take a look at four issues. I pick these four issues not because they're political, they shouldn't be left or right winged. They should be our issues that we battle every day. We look at drilling for oil. This is big business. We have so many blessings because we've innovated how to drill for oil. We've put a person in the space or people in space because of the fuel. 98% of plastics are derived from petroleum. We have all these wonderful technologies based on petroleum based products. But how much oil is left on the planet? Do we know? I have my buddy ask Siri. He's an iPhone guy. He asked Siri. Siri says, let me check. Brought him to a website with British, British Petroleum, estimated 51 years. Wait, what, 51 years? And then other sites say, oh, we have more than that. How much more? So this is where I look at types of technology that we use for this, and how do we extend that 50 years or 100 years? How do we get to that part of it? Another issue that we have is you look at um, water, our water pollution. We have more chemical and fertilizer runoff in our waterways than ever before. We have less green space than before because of how fast we're growing. And you look at the type of filtration, technology, chemicals we use to treat our water. Look at Flint, Michigan. This is a problem that we have every day based on our, uh, based on our, our daily activities, based on our habits that we learn from our parents and our grandparents and our great grandparents. Are we evolving as technology is evolving? Are we doing common sense practice? Then we have, look at our food processing. Look at development of our food. We have seven billion people on the planet today. Seven billion. And we have a hard time feeding everybody now. 20, between 2030 and 2040, we're gonna have around nine billion people. So we need to feed two billion more people between 20, uh, 2020, 2030 and 2040. All right, so look at these issues now. People are moving to the cities, cities are getting bigger. So there's more urban, urban sprawl, less farmland. So we're giving our farmers less, less acres to grow product on. And we've all been exposed to some really good food, I won't lie. We like having food non-frozen. So now we have a demand from a lot of consumers that want the food to be bought locally. 150 miles and in, that tastes the best. So now you have to not freeze it, so you have to make it locally, and we want to use organic type of methods. Well, organic farming means you need more land for the same amount of fruit and vegetables. Wow, how do you feed two billion more people with less land, buy locally, organic? These are some issues that we have. And then we have landfill capacity. This is a hard one, and it's, it's fun for me to share these inf this information. I had to dig for it, and how landfill is in digging. But you look at, there's a website that, that shows that um, Chicago, the city of Chicago, has 10 years left of the landfill capacity. 10 years before they're out of landfill space. That's one big city. 
you look at this, how are we practicing how we get rid of things? We throw a lot of things into the landfill. We look at, well, let's just recycle it. Let's just have better practice. Reduce, reuse, recycle. I get that. A lot of stuff that we're throwing into these things are not recyclable. It's organics, our food scraps. Right now, we're only putting 5% of our organic food waste into compost sites. 95% of our food waste goes to landfills. That's kind of a bad decision, but why do we do it? Because we always have done it. What's the difference between putting it into a compost bin or a landfill bin? There's really no difference, people. The smell is the same. Our garbage doesn't smell good. So to put in a compost bin, smells the same. These are the things that we have to think about. So when I talk about landfill, I want to show you why landfill is becoming a bigger issue. The men and women that remove our, our trash from our houses every, day, every week have done an amazing job of getting it out of our sight, out of our mind. This is what it looked like, a landfill in 1913. This shows open and closed landfills in 1913. We jumped to 1938. A few more landfills pop up from where we go from there. 1963, oh, where are those spots coming from? And the last date I have is from, 19, or is from 2013. Oh my gosh, more people, more rubbish. More rubbish is getting into our backyards. Pretty soon we can't remove it from our neighborhoods because it is our neighborhood. So what do we do about this? This is becoming a big problem. And so, so what I've shown you, I've shown you four major issues, but guess what? They're, they can be easily resolved by embracing innovation and making sustainability in your lifestyle. Here is a product. A garden pot. How can I talk about four giant issues and come back to a garden pot? Let me show you what we invented here and why it touches on all these things and motivate people to make the changes in their lifestyle too. This here is made from not petroleum based plastic, made from plants. It's not soft, it's rigid, it works in production uh, methods, but it's made from plant based plastic called PLA. This specifically comes from corn. We're not using the corn kernel, we're not taking food away from animals and people, but we're using the corn roots and the corn stalks. And we break that down to its sugars and build up a polymer. So now, let's just take the, our petroleum issue. What if we put, we use four billion garden pots a year are sold with plants in them? Four billion, two percent are recycled. Well, it's mostly all petroleum pots. What if we went away from petroleum pots to so using plant-based plastics? And we decided to carpool or drive more a fuel efficient car or decided to use the light rail. What if we had 51 years of oil left and by reducing half our consumption of oil, we now have 100 years? Why that's important, it allows our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren, gives them more time to get, think of a better solution. Well, a lot of times I think we're forcing to support ourselves to come up with a solution based on no time. We're reactive in solving these problems. Let's buy some time. So fertilizer runoff, garden pot. Why is it important for fertilizer runoff? We put plant food already in the plastic. In this, we're, we're using nutrients from other methods of manufacturing. So the byproduct of making ethanol or whiskey is called distiller's grains, DDGs. That has great protein for plants. We've taken that compound in the plant-based plastic, no more need for plant food or fertilizer. So it doesn't run off. And I look at this thing, so we're feeding the roots. If you go to the doctor because you have a bad knee, and your doctor, he or she gives you a neck brace, you're not very happy with your doctor at that point. You want your copay back. So why do we continue to put the plants in the ground, the roots in the ground, and we sprinkle fertilizer and chemicals on the surface? Makes no sense. Too much wind, too much rain, goes right off in our waterways. So then, feeding the world. Now, being from Minnesota, we're much more humble than saying we can solve the world, we feed everybody, but Iowa State did a test for us. Iowa State tested our garden pots with petroleum garden pots and traditional fiber garden pots. They did eggplants, tomatoes, and red peppers. They planted, what they saw, they saw faster growth, bigger plants, more fruits and vegetables because the roots continue to, to be nurtured while they're growing. Eggplants versus the competitor's garden pots, they got two eggplants per garden pot. With our garden pot, with the plant-based one that doesn't go in the landfill, 
these got four eggplants per, and they got bigger eggplants versus the two. Red, uh, red, tom or, um, red peppers, two red peppers per plant versus traditional methods. With this one, seven red peppers per plant. Same amount of soil, same amount of product, not running anything in the, in the waterways, and not drilling for oil. So this is a small little innovative project that's thinking about sustainability. And the cool part about this landfill, this gets planted in the ground with your plant. You peel the tabs, let the roots grow out, it breaks down, as it breaks down, continues to feed the roots of the plant. That's why it, it producing more fruits and vegetables, larger plants, and avoids a landfill. We say, well, we just need to have to recycle more of those four billion pots. Here's the problem. 2% right now are being recycled because of cross-contamination. There's different soils, different media, things in there. So they have to bring them back, use chemicals and water to sterilize them. It's not cost effective. And again, more chemicals and runoff. So we look at these type of applications. And the thing too is recycling. You can only recycle plastic up to five times before it loses its properties. So five times the material, and when you use something that's been recycled, does it say how many times it's been recycled already? We're not documenting how many times we're currently recycling this. So materials like glass, materials like aluminum, steel, they can recycle unlimited amounts. So that's why it's a matter, we should be buying products that can be reused or truly recycled. I look at our grandparents, it's nice when they would bring their coffee container to work and back, their metal fork to work and back. They didn't throw anything away. So that's why we have to look at those things. At the end of the day, we need to embrace innovation to get us to be more sustainable, but we have to act. We have to buy differently. We need to take the responsibility on ourselves and embrace those bold statements, but actually act bolder in making a difference. Thank you.